Okay, well, welcome everyone to Harassa's Asia meeting for 2020. My name is Stephen Melnick, and it's my pleasure and honor to be invited to speak at this wonderful event and to chair this important conversation on Asian solutions for impact-led recovery. During this important discussion, we'll, first of all, talk about what it is, what is impact like re recovery? What are sustainable efforts? What are some of the best practices? What's missing in the industry, in the world? Who are some of the leaders who should be leading this effort? And of course, many, many other items that should be addressed and should be discussed. I'm very fortunate because I have very esteemed panel members who have a lot to contribute to this conversation. And personally, I just cannot wait to start a discussion. And I think a good way to start is for all of us to introduce ourselves. So I guess I might as well uh, lead the way. Uh, as I said, my name is Stephen Melnick. I'm based in New York City, United States, though for winter I run away to warm Miami. Um, I wear four main hats, so I just quickly go through each one. Um, I'm a founder of Political and Business Diplomacy. This is where we help governments and global business leaders achieve their goals through providing access, uh, representing their interests, negotiating agreements, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm also a partner in international gaming company where we offer online and offline gaming solutions to governments and private enterprises, you know, lottery, uh, ruffle, and so on and so forth. And this is the industry that got hit pretty badly due to the virus, and uh, we helped them generate revenue through online efforts uh, so they could use more money for good causes and um, impact like activities, which we're talking about. And speaking of good causes on nonprofit end, I'm also an honorary advisory board member for Liberal and Aid Foundation, which is the nonprofit humanitarian aid arm for Liberal and Free Republic of Liberal. And this is where we bring aid of all kinds all over the world, from food, uh, medical supplies, tech equipment, um, assisting with sustainable agriculture, etc. So with that said, we have, um, as I said, panel of esteemed members, and I'd love to start with one woman on our panel. Helen, could you be so kind to tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Helena Montgomery. Thank you very much for having me on this uh, event. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm an economist, statistician, computer scientist. Um, I'm actively involved in technology, cybersecurity, finance projects, all sorts of different things. Um, and uh, I am looking towards to doing only projects that are ESG related. Very nice. Thank you. And I guess we'll go from right to left on my end. So, Daniel, please. I will uh, pass Technology 101 by unmuting myself. Um, I'm Dan Kern. I am the Chief Investment Officer of TFC Financial Management, which is a Boston, Massachusetts-based investment advisor that works primarily with individuals and families. So I'm in my day job an ESG investor, um, but I also come at this topic from, from a couple of other different angles. I'm on the board of, of trustees for the Green Century Funds, which is an environmentally focused ESG mutual fund company. And I'm also on the board of advisors for the Brandeis University International Business School. And a significant percentage of Brandeis's um, business school students come from Asia. So I, I, I can look at the world both through an Asia lens as well as an ESG lens. Very nice. Thank you. And um, Leon, would you please? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, very nice to meet all of you and also fellow panelists. Um, and thank you, Horizons, for being here. Um, I'm Leon Tove, uh, Executive Director of Damson Capital. We are uh, impact investors based here in Singapore uh, with a focus on investing in companies in, across Asia who have a, a UN SDG or the Sustainable Development Goal bottom line. And we target uh, these companies uh, all across Asia who are trying to change the world in their small way. We're an early stage uh, investor. And we are a direct investor. So we both invest mm -hmm. and support their growth uh, out here in Asia. Um, yeah, I'll leave it right there. But uh, really great to meet up. Thank you very much. Ken, would you please? 
Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Ken Hu. I'm an engineer, also a uh, founder and uh, entrepreneur. My company, together with Yale, Princeton, MIT, uh, Bob Langer, uh, folks in uh, Boston know him. Um, we have invented a ultra-sensitive chemical sensor. The chemical sensor can be used to detect uh, diseases, chem biochemistry signatures in your blood and urine, as well as uh, uh, air pollution, water pollution, and so on. So we are the receiving end of uh, impact investing, and uh, it will be very interesting to hear uh, what's the value of impact investing from uh, from the investor's point of view and what startup can deliver, not just to the investors. I think what impact would the investor uh, to see us to deliver to the stakeholders, the patients, the polluted city in India to China, and our American uh, friends in Delaware, <laughs> who is um, heading the next wave of um, hopefully a better table manners. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Ken. Alex, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Manson, SC Ventures. Um, SC Ventures is a, is a business unit of, uh, of Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, simply doing, uh, we run, uh, we run a, an innovation app. Which we call the accelerator. We uh, we invest in uh, the startups we we partner with, either within the bank or in the ventures we're building. And uh, as a separate matter, we build our own ventures, exploring other business models, ranging from digital banks to uh, platforms to technology businesses adjacent to to, to banking or, or or actually not. Um, that's that's what we do. Very nice. Thank you very much. And Christian. <laughs> Hello, good morning from Tokyo. Uh, I'm Christian, I'm German. I'm based in Tokyo since 20 years and uh, I'm the founder of the Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystem. And I'm also the CMO of uh, the Rice Exchange, uh, which, which is a digital trading platform for trading rice internationally, integrating all the service providers. And what we're doing with the Purpose Driven mm -hmm. Innovation Ecosystem is Corporate transformation on the one hand, and we're working with all the stakeholders to uh, really transform from a linear economy to a circular economy. And uh, not only uh, do this from an investment perspective from ESG uh, point of view, but really going to the fundamental uh, change which is necessary to uh, enable yeah, a better tomorrow. So. We are just partnering now with the Earthshot Prize, uh, the Royal Foundation in the UK. And in five categories, uh, climate change revives the oceans, uh, build a waste-free world. Uh, Prince William and Sir David Attenborough have announced uh, this Earthshot Prize uh, in, in uh, conjunction with John F. Kennedy, who announced the moonshot in the 60s uh, for game-changing initiatives. And uh, we are one of 100 uh, organizations worldwide which is able to nominate uh, these kind of earth shots. So that's, that's very exciting. And um, in the next 10 years, we need these earth shots to really transform into a new kind of economy. Thanks very much for being here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. And uh, as I uh, hope uh, I see more and more people are joining our uh, talk. So um, I hope everybody got to understand and appreciate the nature of the background of our panelists, because there's definitely a lot to be discussed. And I think we should start with fundamentals and maybe some definitions to make sure everyone who is joining us and listening and will be watching this later on is on the same page with us. So when we talk about impact um, type of activities, um, just so everyone on the same page, we are obviously discussing a type of activities that achieve something positive for society as a whole. And there's a growing list of such activities ranging from education, energy, uh, water, health care, and you know, affordable housing, renewable energy, microfinance. And of course, these activities don't have to be direct. They could be indirect with a longer type of benefits for, to the society. But since we talk about definitions, um, I'd like to start at the end, so to speak. And uh, Ken, if you don't mind, uh, since you are on, on the end, on the recipient end, right, uh, and you're usually quite often perhaps looked at as a recipient, is there a really uh, good understanding, and since we're focusing this conversation on Asia, right, uh, 
on what impact type of activities really are, or is there some segment of the population that you deal with that really confuses it with, I don't know, maybe charity or something along these lines? Oh, what a great question. I think, Stephen, you didn't read the, uh, the feedback we have sent in, uh, in advance, right? So as a startup, um, many investors might already know we're constantly raising funds. And uh, fortunately, we are more mature. Um, you know, we're uh, revenue generating. We ha we're talking to PEs and, and also, um, you know, we are um, starting to have sales channel. Uh, nevertheless, we continue to struggle. Uh, very often, impact investing is not a topic to be discussed in China. It's specific, specifically, uh, I am Chinese American, right? And uh, however, my Swedish side, uh, when I go to Sweden, um, impact investing is all we talk about. And um, so there, are, there is no confusion. And a very sophisticated uh, impact investors very much understand SEG or impact investing is not philanthropy. It's not charity and deliver better returns. Um, our fellow Chinese, though, um, start to understand that. But uh, when people talk about impact investing, they very much think it's uh, charity um, and, and confused with philanthropy. And then um, for startups, are very hard. Um, if I can add one more thing um, is I think uh, both from a uh, startup perspective as well as investors perspective, we both need to do a better job in terms of communicating the value. Um, you know, uh, for your investors, uh, our fellow investors, how do you uh, deliver value to your investors? Is it just the bottom line? We talked to uh, uh, UPS, uh, UBS's uh, oncology fund. It was uh, the so-called impact investing was it was not articulated at all. Yeah, we talked to a small, uh, smaller firms. Um, they are extremely passionate and well-defined what the uh, baseline is, what is the deliverable, That's what's the returns. I think uh, at the same time, us as a uh, startup need to do a better job as well. I'd love to hear the wisdom of the panel. Yeah, well, speaking of wisdom of the pack, uh, anybody else would like to add to this point? It is, I would like to. Uh, it is a uh, no-brainer to uh, find a project that does serves human beings uh, really, truly, instead of vaporware or you know some idea that's great that truly serves human beings. Of course, you're going to make money. I mean, if you have the right all the right pieces, the management team, all that stuff. There's nothing wrong with making money and then doing good. <clears throat> and this is. Um, it's just simply that it makes sense. It is sustainable, meaning you can build a business that works. And there isn't just one area. You don't have to save the the, the oceans only. You don't have to, you know, uh, support um, uh, you know parentless babies in in Africa. There are many other things. For example, logistics. You can improve the logistics. Um, uh, systems in the world so that they can be inter interoperable with the rest of the world and interconnect them. You can improve the banking system so that uh, normal people, not people who have transacted in the hundreds of millions a year, can um, receive a check that they use, uh, that they need that day and not have to wait eight days to receive those funds. Those are types of projects that we're working on to make um, real impact on real people. And of course, there are businesses that that do things, you know, that make money and stuff like that. So, it is um, a no-brainer. Yeah, thank you, Helena. Stephen, you know, I think there's. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just want to say this conversation really comes back to the old saying: uh, you could do good and do well in the same time, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what yeah. it is. Uh, yes, please, yeah. Leon. Um, thanks, thanks, Stephen. Um, I really appreciate Helena and, and Ken's uh, points, and I think that there was a few elements to it, right? W one is, um, you know, uh, just just looking from an investor perspective, and what we are kind of um, providing as a promissory note to our investors. And I think that it really starts from also just talking about ESG and impact investing. And as much as I, I think impact investing is a subset to ESG. 
um, impact investing is a lot more targeted. And I think the discernment between just uh, what we call as ESG is, you know, best practices in, in those elements of what company should be governed, you know, its stakeholders who should be considered. But I think impact investing is a lot more deliberate in identifying opportunities and gaps where we're trying to use enterprise-based solutions to solve big problems. And I think that's the critical nature of it. And of course, the context of it all is the fact that a lot of the companies we tend to target as a, as a thesis is that, you know, if they work like a charity programmatically to solve problems, you know, we've seen charities and nonprofits do it, and we've seen how far they can go, but we definitely know it hasn't quite crossed the mark on certain elements in the world. And likewise of governments as our expectations of them on market gaps. And the last bit, of course, on enterprises who are trying to provide solutions, but also are stopping on the mark for certain elements of vulnerable populations. So I think in that degree, degree, impact investments go into enterprises like Ken, who are trying to solve big problems, trying to be sustainable and trying to amalgamate all these programmatic uh, solutions in one. And I think that that's where it becomes quite um, unique whether we call them social enterprises or impact ventures or, or the works. Um, so yeah, just adding on those two cents. Thank you, thank you. We touched upon quite a few subjects in, in one point. I, what I wanted to do is just to go quickly back to what one of the things Ken mentioned that uh, it's not simply doing a good thing. It's not a charity, it's actually provides good returns. And just to give some statistics uh, that uh, I had somebody pull for me, uh, overall, 64% of actively managed ESGs, ESGs, right, environmental, social, governmental funds, beat their benchmark versus 49% of traditional funds through the first week of August 2020. This is the RBC capital markets, which is kind of very interesting, which brings me to a question because on one side, you know, a natural default thought is, you know, businesses are there to make money. They're not there to make the world a better place. And it can really free market in, uh, enterprises regulate this themselves, or does this re require really for government to come in and write strict laws requiring companies to do that? And Daniel, uh, you as a chief investment officer who kind of goes through this decision process internally as you serve the family offices and uh, your other clients, and how you allocate these funds. How do you make these types of decisions? Is there a trade-off or is this, can you have a cake and eat it too? Well, I think part of the, part of the issue here is distinguishing between different flavors of, of investment. There's what I would define as socially responsible investing, which is generally exclusionary. The, the classic, I don't want to own alcohol, tobacco, and, and, and weapons. Um, there, depending on how widespread your exclusions are, there potentially is a performance trade-off. There is ESG investing, which I would view, which I would define as being um, in investment considering environmental, social, and governance criteria. And firms that do ESG right, I think, really are picking up potential liabilities on balance sheets that are maybe not financial, maybe not financially materially to, material today, but would become financially material in the in the future. I think ultimately all good fundamental investment firms will be incorporating financially material ESG criteria into their in, investment process. But the third dimension of this is impact investing, which I think most people in the in the states don't really understand, at least outside of the family office realm, your mainstream investor and mainstream advisor doesn't really understand the, the opportunity inherent in solutions-based impact investing and really where there is a double bottom line to impact investing. So I think, you know, the road leads to uh, definitional problems. If, if, different approaches are better defined, then investors can make better informed decisions about what they do, what they do with their capital. Hmm. Anyone would like to add to this? I just wanted to add um, that uh, it, it all comes down to, to the three P's, right? The people, planet, and I call it prosperity. I don't say profit uh, because uh, that's, that's finally what we all need to achieve. 
and prosperity is not only related to uh, financial returns, but I also pulled up a, a definition uh, of impact investing. And uh, it includes something that says to generate a measurable, beneficial social or environmental uh, impact alongside a financial return. This would be impact investment. So we, with impact investment, we always seek for a financial return, but not all the, the problems on this planet can be solved only by looking at financial returns. So we also need uh, philanthropic uh, and uh, charitable organizations which actually tackle the problems which uh, don't lead necessarily to financial returns. But I think that uh, large corporations can also integrate uh, aspects uh, of uh, philanthropy in their impact investing strategy so that that will actually um, <clears throat> increase the value of their brand and also give more purpose uh, to, to the employees working at this, this company. So uh, that's really not only to the outside, but also to the inside. Uh, we will uh, create a more energetic uh, workforce and we will uh, yeah, go towards more uh, purpose and impact. And that uh, finally can also be measurable. But of course, at the moment, uh, one of the aspects which is very often debated is how to actually measure uh, the impact. So may maybe that's, that's also one, one of the questions we could uh, yeah. pick on. Absolutely. Measuring is, is, is a big item um, for us to get to. Hopefully we will, uh, given time. But you mentioned, you know, the, the question always comes up when discussing this type of topic or thinking about it. How do you make, you know, like there's almost a feeling that Somebody needs to make corporations do that. And Christian, you pointed out that uh, besides what we already discussed in substance, you know, the, these types of investments actually produce uh, very good results. But again, to provide some numbers and statistics, Morgan Stanley Institute for Sustainable Investing, uh, they polled uh, consumers and nearly nine in 10 U.S. consumers anyway, say that when they purchase a product, they will give a preference to a company that kind of uh, addresses their preference or their you know, good cause in terms of environment or other um, sustainable type of uh, measures that they believe in. And mm. you mentioned other benefits, especially, it's, I think it's especially true to millennials uh, in terms of retention, right? So people stay at the job longer, it's cheaper payroll and so on and so forth. So, so there are very, very tangible items, but, I guess we might as well address it right now, uh, since Christian brought it up. So, but how do we measure it? You know, instead of delaying this big elephant in the room, uh, instead of giving it a lip service, instead of putting a general rubric on it, how do we come up with something specific? And there are, there are some best practices out there. Anybody would like to address that? I have a lot of, um, Please, Helena. experience in this, uh, all projects are, as I call them, uh, all projects are related to measure. So you have goals, you have missions and goals um, and objectives, and all of those have some kind of measure in terms of time and uh, uh, profit and uh, also um, environmental or social good. And you establish that, whatever it is, just like the, the Constitution of the United States, it's it's bendable, it's it's moldable. But for each project, it's different because you can't apply one type of um, environmental goal to another project, or social goal to another project, or financial goal to another project because the scale is different, and the type of team there that uh, what they're capable is different. So what you do is you establish those measures and those goals at the beginning. You establish a mission at the beginning. And then you work from there. Everybody's goal, everybody's uh, task is related to the, that eventually moves up to that mission. Everybody's always doing something to, towards those goals that you establish with the team. Hmm. Very good. Thank you, Helena. Um, I, would also, I could see some, some people jumping up uh, when you're saying like United States uh, moldable constitution. I guess that depends uh, which audience you're talking to. But but when it comes to measurement, uh, anybody else can uh, would like to uh, have some experience in this? Ken, please. 
Yeah, I would love to. Um, so we had a number of conversation with um, investors in the past. Um, when we do our uh, introduction as the um, standard pitch, then the investors usually also do their pitch to us, like, you know, why uh, they are a good partner with us. And they will demonstrate how many exit they had, you know, how many billions they have put in and, and so on and so forth. Never, we probably went through, you know, a very long roster of investors. Never for once, especially in the life science and diagnostic vertical, never ever for once somebody measure their success by how many patients' life they have saved. Stop for one second to think about that. Never for once they have measured to say how many families' agony we have alleviated by the billions of dollars and the PhDs armed to their teeth. Why That's do you think that is? Why do you think that is, Ken? Well, <laughs> that is for my uh, esteem, uh, esteemed panel to answer. And I would... Uh, um, uh, there is a very, very uh, capable uh, person um, who is heading the um, Orbit Med, and I call them out in New York. And I, uh, after their presentation, I went to him and I said, uh, uh, how come uh, with all your analysts and so on, uh, there was never a slide, not just for us, but I'm sure you give a lot of uh, talks to encourage your peers, other investors, to demonstrate their true impact, right? And that um, I would love to see, and I hope um, this is a, I have a small voice here to make people heard. Thank you, thank you, Ken. Go ahead, Daniel, you wanted to add something? Can, can I share one hypothesis, at least please. on- I'd love uh, to hear a hypothesis, please. So, so, so having spent a lot of time during my career um, with regulators, um, I, I think at least in the, in the US governance system, um, providing a measure of lives saved would undoubtedly run afoul of, of various examiners and the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I think that is part of, I, I think that's, that's part, of the, part of the issue. But I've, I've taken it as a to-do. Um, one of my closest friends is, is working on COVID, is one of the senior people working on, on one of the, uh, the uh, treatments for COVID uh, uh, that, that's gotten emergency use authorization. And I, when I talk to him in the next couple of days, I'm going to ask him about about that yeah. and 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 how they think about that and what they would like to say versus what they're allowed to say by by the SEC and the FDA. Yeah, and, and put it a very good comment. And putting aside even regulatory uh, perspectives, and I am, uh, um, you know, we'll take a blame as serving as a regulator, financial industry professionals, but as an attorney, on the other hand. There's a liability issue here. I mean, yeah. once you mention life saved, inevitably the question will be, well, how many lives did you not save with these <laughs> matters and why? <laughs> right? So that, that becomes a whole yeah. other conversation. There's always, you know, whenever something happens, I find there's always kind of a jam of a reason for it. Uh, and I think we kind of uncovered at least uh, some of them. Having said that, uh, there are definitely a lot of things that are being done the right way. And uh, I'd love to explore that and maybe we could talk about you know, some of the best practices. And Alex, I'd like to trouble you for a bit and see your perspectives on what do you think is being done right uh, in terms of impact type of activities and specifically uh, in Asia markets and where? Sure. Um, look, look the, the, you know, a lot of things have been said about uh, about um, you know impact investing already on this panel and and uh, I, I was um, I was almost tempted to bifurcate the the, the, the conversation between uh, uh, in, impact investing and ESG as an operating constraint me meaning you know do your business but you know do do, do no bad things make sure you're you know make, make sure you only uh, do, do the things the right way support uh, support environmentally friendly projects etc 
and um, and, uh, and, uh, and the broader the broader thing, which has also been alluded to, which is a more purpose driven sort of um, uh, business. Um, and, and, and we talked about um, uh, cementing the loyalty of your coworkers. We talked a little bit of, about millennials, but I don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, restricted to millennials at all. Um, and and uh, and, um, and, uh, and and I think somebody said, um, you know, it's not charity. It's not, you know, it's not really philanthropy. It's certainly not CSR. It's uh, it's business as a force for good. Um, the, the, I, I think of the former as a, as increasingly a given, and I and and uh, and, uh, and I would have thought either one of um, of, uh, of regulators, policymakers, or the inve- or investors, or the consumer public will will uh, will. Um, Increasingly systematically, quote unquote, punish corporates who are not living within the operating constraints that I was referring to. So, uh, in other words, I, I, I would think of it as um, hygiene, meaning everyone will ultimately do it, meaning it's not very differentiated. So, so it's important, but um, but um, you know, in fact, probably non-negotiable, but but not that differentiated. Um, in order to to get. To, 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 to achieve abnormal returns in business, I think the, the, the latter proposition is, uh, is, is, is more important, is the winner. In other, words, in other words, companies defining purpose and, and sort of a north star, which is, uh, which is focused on doing things that are genuinely valuable to, to, to societies, right? And, and, and thinking of that, really thinking of the societal purpose um, and, and what problems they are solving, and um, and, uh, and and building solid business models on, on, on the back of it, at which point profits will follow. They are an output of doing those things, as opposed to as opposed to what you start with. Um, in, in in my mind, companies you know best practices is, is, is that it's 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 uh, it's it's companies that have on you know <coughs> clearly and and and. Um, and Meaning to themselves as well as to their investors and and, uh, and, and and their clients, what what their purpose is, what problem they're solving, and um, and presumably and hopefully this is a problem worth solving from the standpoint of the, the good of the planet, and um, and, um, and 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 we'll do you know, we'll make money on the back of this. So think of it as business as a force for good. Any of these companies, and there's increasingly some in Asia, but it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 a trend. It's an early trend. Um, I think is very well positioned to uh, to, to lead in the future. Mm. Well, thank you. Um, you know, uh, I love theory. Uh, one of my hats is I teach in the business school. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people who join our panel and maybe watching and listening and a lot of entrepreneurs out there may be looking for some tips, maybe some directions, maybe something specific. Uh, anyone... What would you say if you were, if I were to invite you to a podium in the business school where we have, you know, CEOs coming in to learn from some of the leaders? What tips would you give to these people? So you know, you know, keep talking for a while and and, uh, and submit a couple of working working assumptions and maybe others can uh, can, can build on a compliment. But uh, but a, a generic tip and then a, and then a specific one. Generic tip is you know I find that linking what we're doing. To an outcome of the SDGs is uh, is 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 not a bad framework. is 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 a good reference. So, in other words, as a, as I run a project, as I set up a business unit, as I position a business unit for you know with a certain purpose, which one of the SDGs does it advance, and 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 can I quantify this? And so so so, so as a as a, as a benchmark framework frame of reference, it's uh, it's uh, you know I think it's uh, it's helpful as a Personally, and, and obviously coming from a from a from a financial uh, institution background, um, I I I think that financial inclusion is is arguably one of the one of the most worthwhile sort of um, you know, impact okay. uh, objectives. <clears throat> in in the context of financial inclusion, I I focus a lot on uh, on the forgotten middle, uh, which is the SMEs. Uh, SMEs are a critical engine for pretty much all the markets we operate in, certainly that's the case in Asia. Um, they're not particularly well served or banked by large financial institutions. They're sort of stuck between that vast consumer market and, um, and, uh, and, and the large corporates. 
Thank you. Um, just uh, since we, we're limited in time, I just want to make sure, first hmm. of all, I give an opportunity to somebody else to share some of their best practices um, uh, before, because I'd love to co cover a few other points. So anybody else would love to, would like to share their perspectives and some tips? Yes, please, Liam. Um, yeah, thanks so much. And I, I actually just have to say that I've, I've learned a lot from Alex as well as a, as a practitioner. Um, because we've met before and he shared his perspectives. I think for us at Damson, you know, there, there's a couple of interesting elements, right? We invest in, we have a, just to give something tangible, we have a, a green logistics company in, you know, uh, in Indonesia. Where we deliver packages at zero carbon footprint and we, we hire youth at risk, marginalize youth, youth with some disability. There's a tangibility behind, of course, uh, a lot of the beneficiaries who are being hired and that being targeted to be able to support them. And of course, linking that with the SDGs, you know, from a carbon footprint standpoint, and also in terms of reach of how much of a rural uh, or secondary kind of um, uh, areas which have not been logistically connected to and how we are trying to connect with them. Um, but I think in, in context on the opposite side, of course, for biotech, you know, we, we have a, a company which is f specifically focusing on Asian phenotypes where clinical trials, I think about 60, 70 percent of them, globally, which are being done, are just not targeting, um, you know, Asian populations, for example. And so then the outcomes for med medicinal, you know, um, pharma or therapeutics become also challenged. And that becomes less of a, a qu quantitative numbers as much as a qualitative thesis. And it's challenging to balance between the two elements. But I think if we had to really uh, frame it in, in a, a single approach, you know, for us, uh, impact is always defined. I mean, there are, you know, things like the SASB, which is the materiality matching and, you know, the gin network, which is all about the metrics and the numbers, right? And some of them do really well in contextualizing the needs and the outcomes. But in, in actuality, the problem isn't so much about the metrics. It's also about the context that we're dealing with. And I think, you know, if we look at, for example, um, uh, parts of um, Asia, when it comes to agriculture, it was never about um, about how many jobs you created in agriculture, because we have a lot of people in ag agriculture. It was actually about, you know, how much income we're actually transferring them, so much so that the secondary effect of the impact of income is that they start thinking outside their comfort zone and start realizing that they can start sending the kids to school and they can actually start improving the lives of those individuals. So the context of how we approach it is extremely important. And we start looking very deeply into the secondary and tertiary impacts. As a result, your theory of change becomes much clearer to the investor and becomes very tangible in that sense. So that's my two cents. Thank you, thank you. I don't, I don't see any questions from the audience. If anybody has questions, we have a few minutes left. Please don't be shy. But what I'd like to ask uh, my panel is so who's going to lead this i mean we talk about asia in general but you know which countries will lead uh this push for impact based activities uh and uh you know are we talking about those who create the most damage right now or those who have the best ability or a combination of the two helen you have your hand up please yes um, there are a lot of, if you're just talking about Asian nations, there are a lot of uh, nations that do um, exports as a part of their GDP. The number one in Asia, I think, would be Hong Kong, and then there's Singapore, then Vietnam. Uh, you know, China is so is a juggernaut, is really, really big, but uh, their percentage of GDP of exports is 17% or something like that, as opposed to 36% from the, from, you know, years before. The meaning of that is who does who where do their products go um, and I mean what customers will be able to use their products as and services and so from that when you look at the economy side you're able to say okay so how do you serve those countries that do a lot of business outside in the world it is it could be inside Asia but also it's the countries themselves as a whole, um, how do you serve that? So what I hope I'm getting my point across, but um, so as an investor, uh, you pick a uh, do good project that also serves and makes money. But uh, one important aspect is we need to have governance. We need to be able to have a, a, ideally a, a DD book that says 100 pages that says, 
you are the com the company that you're doing is exactly doing what it is uh, you purport it to be doing. You have things that prove that you're actually doing it. And um, all the things that you claim when you're doing your pitch to an investor, I want to make sure that you're actually doing it. So all about measurable goals, all, all about uh, your financials, all those things that need, like, for example, if we have a, a impact related um, project in Vietnam, I would love to invest, invest in all these projects. But how do you know that they are real and that are not going to cheat you of money? And they're actually just Thank real. You, we got 90 seconds left. I'd like to give uh, somebody else an opportunity to share last thoughts. Christian, please. <clears throat> I would like to give a uh, very interesting view uh, because I'm, I'm sitting in a, Yeah, Japan is very underestimated, uh, but they have uh, a very comprehensive vision uh, called Society 5.0. So it's digital transformation, it's sustainability, and uh, it's uh, building a comprehensive long-term strategy and I think that uh, the nature and the culture of Japan, if it's also uh, being able to be disrupted a little bit more and the mindset uh, shifts towards a more innovative thinking that we can expect a lot uh, from Japan and uh, maybe that, and I, I always say it's not that one takes a leadership, but there has, there has to be a vision to go forward. And if if we find some kind of vision like this, Maybe Society 5.0 could be an answer to many questions. Well, speaking of vision and speaking of leadership, I think this is exactly the premise behind this type of conversation that Harass has put together globally on different topics. And uh, this certainly, uh, I'm sure all those who participated besides my panel members will agree, uh, was a very intellectually stimulating conversation that I think should continue uh, perhaps in other forums. So on my end, I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, thank you for your time and your help. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You, it was Bye. a real pleasure to see all the faces and uh, looking forward to following up once God's willing, we'll go live in person some next event. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Great point, Christian, by the way. <laughs> Japan 5.0. I think I, sh I haven't read it since the last time you mentioned it, so I I'll have to go do that. I will send you a presentation. What yeah, that? that would be great. What is that? Society 5.0. I, I, I can send you a presentation. Yeah. Oh, that would be wonderful. Japan has a very strong vision behind it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It does have, actually, technologically, it is uh, rather advanced. They do take up a lot of new technologies very well. The problem is, is that they are uh, fearful and they've gone through a financial crisis. Yes. And they are living through and continuing to live through and honor uh, debts. And so the banking and financial system is the problem there right now. And they're still emotionally trying to get over that. They have multi-generational uh, debt that um, when they buy into a house, their parents died and they, they, yeah. the children still have to come up with that money to pay for mm -hmm. that house that is underwater. It's not like the United States, you know, where you're underwater. Get rid of um, I wanted to ask, uh, you were cut off.